Okay, so welcome to um, our third round, of, uh, third round of our symposium, third day, uh, Skills to Last a Decade. Um, this is the agenda for today, so um, we will just have a very short uh, welcome and introduction to uh, what Women in Data uh, is. And then we have our first talk by Mongorata Adamczyk. Um, she will talk about a real world machine learning project uh, about news article classification. And afterwards, we will take a, uh, a group picture where I will ask you to put your um, to turn your cameras on. Of course, only those who want that, uh, because afterwards we will post it on our uh, social media. And afterwards, we will have uh, Nicole, who just wrote me that she will join late, um, but she will join. Um, so by Nicole Butnatier, um, she will have her talk uh, called "Be the Signal, Not the Noise." Um, the moderators for today are myself, Luisa, I'm from the content coordination team, and Melanie from the marketing team, uh, who was kind enough to join as a last minute backup. And uh, just a few words about Women in Data. So, um, Women in Data is a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase diversity in data careers. We provide awareness and education to women in uh, tech, specifically in analytics, data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And just um, to a quick as a quick overview of um, who our members are. So we're not all only professional data scientists. We also have newbies. Um, we also have transitioners, so people who are working in, uh, in other fields, often um, scientific fields, and they're tra transitioning into data, data career. Uh, but also we have data enthusiasts who are working in data science, um, have been working in data science for a long time and are um, real experts. And just uh, a few numbers about, uh, about women in data, so our community um, counts over 10,500 uh, women. We have 25 chapters all over the world. Um, you are now joining uh, joining uh, this symposium from the Berlin chapter, which was uh, just newly founded uh, and is the first chapter in Europe as well. And um, for all the chapters, we already had over 100 events um, so far. And well, you're joining one of them. A very uh, quick reminder of our code of conduct that Melanie has posted or will post in the chat, um, the link to the chat uh, in the chat. Um, so yeah, you have heard about this, um, I guess. So it's uh, we don't accept any abusive, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory behavior. Um, and if you, if one of you experiences um, behave, such behavior by uh, someone else, please flag that to me uh, or Melanie. And yeah, before we start, just a quick, um, a quick uh, overview of where you can follow us and uh, keep uh, stay in touch with us. So we are on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, where, by the way, this call will be, uh, this talk will be um, recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Our first speaker that uh, we are very happy to have today is Margorata Adamczyk. Uh, she is an ML, uh, ML engineer at Axel Springer AI, the Artificial Intelligence Unit of Axel Springer. She previously was a member of the data science team at Idealo, where she also met our uh, Berlin chapter founder, <laughs> uh, Mina Saito, and she worked on, uh, Mograta worked on projects in the mains of uh, natural language processing, computer vision, and is currently exploring the potential of the speech to text models in the media industry. We're super happy to have her today and very exciting, uh, excited for her talk. Uh, thank you, Luisa. Um... Shall I share my screen? All right. So I guess I can skip this slide and this slide because you introduced me already. Uh, I'll only mention that Axel Springer AI also does um, their, well, we do our own research and we contribute to the open source uh, community. So if you're interested in NLP or computer vision, 
please check out our GitHub because you may find some interesting libraries there. Um, and this is the agenda for my talk. I will first uh, introduce you to Update and to the project we are working on right now. And uh, then I will go through the steps of a typical machine learning project and try to answer the questions you, you see here in the agenda. Uh, so let's start with Update. Um, if you don't know, this is the, an app for Samsung mobile phones. They, are, they aggregate uh, news articles from many different sources and uh, show you as a user um, those articles that they think you may like. And uh, broadly speaking, how it works is you have an article and then uh, it goes through some kind of system or pipeline and at the end we get a JSON file where uh, you have all the information about the article. And if you look at the bottom of the JSON, you have a category and our project with Update is exactly about this, about predicting the category of an article. And um, Update is active in many countries, in many languages. So the challenge here in this project is to make a system that will work as well for all the languages uh, that are available. Um, and the first question you can ask yourself when you think about what's, what happens in a machine learning project is uh, how much machine learning there is actually in such projects. And according to the Google research uh, team, there is very little machine learning uh, in the machine learning project. So only this black box represents uh, the, the code uh, related to machine learning in, in the whole broad spectrum of um, tasks and elements you need to fulfill in a project. Uh, but I would say that this, uh, this figure is not really informative. You still don't get a good impression of what happens in a machine learning project exactly and when. So I found this uh, figure uh, giving you a bit of a time context. So as you can see, well, first of all, again, we see the confirmation of how little modeling there is in a machine learning model. Uh, but we can also see that in the first uh, um, couple of weeks, uh, you may not do any modeling at all. Uh, you first focus on understanding the business, defining uh, your product, then looking into the data, understanding it, pre-processing, and only towards the end of the project you actually start with the machine learning and the evaluation of the project. Uh, but I would still say that uh, quite a lot is missing in this uh, picture. So I found a third one, and that's the final one. That's the picture we're going to use throughout this um, presentation. Uh, and it's by Databricks and Accenture. Um, so um, we again see the business objective, product definition, uh, like in the previous figure. Then we have the entire data part where we prepare the data, um, do the modeling and evaluation. And once our model is um, finished, is, is ready and it's evaluated, we still need to put it into production and uh, monitor it uh, basically constantly to, to check whether it's working, whether it's um, giving us reasonable results. And I think this part, the whole half of the circle of the cycle is often omitted when you read blog posts about machine learning projects. But uh, actually without the deployment and monitoring, uh, all the work you, you've done to, to make a model is useful, useless because um, it's not serving anyone its purpose. So I will also try to mention some things about uh, those elements of the machine learning project cycle. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. So from the business objective and product definition, how we did it in our project was through a scoping session. And for us, it was a two hour long meeting where we invited all the stakeholders, so all the teams that had to be involved in this project. And we discussed uh, all aspects of, of the whole idea and the project. So here in the picture, you see our agenda. You see that we had a problem statement. We talked about the goals. We talked about what aren't our goals, who are the users of our product, etc. cetera. Um, on, on the internet, you'll find many different templates for um, such scoping session. And I would recommend you uh, 
um, just finding something that suits you the most. Maybe it's not this template. And um, during this session, um, you want to uh, understand and align the objectives and the goals of each stakeholder. Uh, in our case, we focus on the business, uh, the technology. So uh, in here, we talked about how we want to use uh, machine learning or deep learning for, for this classifier. Uh, but we also talked about our personal goals and those you can see here in the picture. Um, we, we all spoke about what we want to learn during the project and I found it very nice. Um, and the result of our scape, scoping session was a definition of an MVP that stands for minimum viable product. So basically we defined what our product needs to be like, um, what requirements it needs to meet to be usable for, uh, for the content team in our case and to be integrated in the system. Um, and then we sat down and we created a roadmap to um, put it on the timeline. So we took all our goals and uh, phrased them in a nicer way. And we decided what needs to be done uh, by which date. And we also split those goals or milestones uh, between the teams that were involved so that everyone uh, knows and is clear to them what is expected of them by which date. Um, and then we uh, again wrote some stuff. This time these were tickets. So we work with a ticket system called Jira. I hope most of you are aware of what it is. Uh, so here's the example of a, of a ticket. Uh, as you can see, it's very broad. As a mach machine learner, I want to train a classification model so that I can label articles. It's very generic and broad, so of course you cannot just complete this ticket in a day. And that's why we split them into smaller tasks that are easier to wrap your he head around and complete within hours or days. And um, then you, you see our board, so we have uh, different columns and we were moving the tickets around, um, like it usually happens in the case of a ticket system. Um, but uh, here I only want to mention that Jira is of course a paid system that some companies use, but if you want to do your own project, you can find a free of chart, charge um, um, project boards. For example, GitHub has one, I'm sure there are many more open source ticket boards. Um, and yeah, now that we have all the tickets and we know exactly want to, what we want to or need to do, we can move on to the data part. Uh, and here the first thing you do is data pre-processing. And on the internet, you can find the information about the 80-20 rule that says that you spend 80% of your time pre-processing the data and only 20% on performing the analysis and understanding the data. Uh, I would say it's not exactly true. I would say that in our topic, uh, in our project, we uh, spend more time exploring the data than pre-processing it. So it very much depends on the project and uh, the type of the data you work with. Uh, we definitely focus on data exploration more. And there is the saying garbage in, garbage out, and it's very true for machine learning models. If you don't make sure that your data is, well, makes sense, is of good quality, then you shouldn't really expect any reasonable predictions uh, from the model you trained on this data. So we really took our time here to, to familiarize ourselves with the data. Uh, uh, another good thing about it is that when something really goes wrong with, with the model, with the training, and there is some, some weird prediction happening, uh, knowing your data well will allow you to make more informed guesses on how to fix it and where the problem lies. So I really recommend spending more time here than on pre-processing. <laughs> uh, and this is the example of what we found during our uh, data exploration. Uh, it turned out that uh, the labels that we had in our data set were inconsistent. Uh, so here you see three articles about the Opera, that is a form of the other, not a search engine. And the first two come from the training set and the last one comes from the evaluation set that we used to assess the quality of the model. And as you can see, someone who was labeling those articles 
uh, assigned different labels to, to those uh, data sets, uh, to the articles about OPERA. So this is of course a huge confusion to the model and to us. And um, it was a very interesting finding uh, that helped us uh, progress with the, with the project. Um, and once we discovered everything we need about the data, we can start with the machine learning part. Uh, so uh, how I like to do it uh, is to start with the notebook. We use Jupyter Notebook and just uh, created a workflow, a pipeline that uh, worked. We could try out the different approaches, different libraries, models, different strategies for um, pre-processing the data, embeddings. And uh, I think notebook allows you to be very flexible and adjust quickly uh, for this kind of experimentation. And um, yeah, once it works and you know which direction you're going with, with your model, uh, you can turn it into a script. And here you, uh, of course, take the, the code that you already wrote and turn them into reusable functions. Uh, here you think more about the structure and um, um, also about the future. So our first iteration of the project was uh, focusing on two languages, but we knew that overall at the end, the, our, our script needs to be suitable for all the languages Update has. So, uh, I don't know, over 20 or something like that. So uh, we thought about all the possible variations in the input data and we included this in our code. And um, last but not least, you write the documentation and the tests for your code. And even though it's, it's not particularly pleasant, it's very helpful because um, someone may join your team in a couple of months and this will be very helpful for them to have the documentation um, that is thorough and informative. You may forget yourself in a couple of months uh, what you wrote there and what this part of the code is doing. And um, another aspect of it is that um, if you're struggling with writing the documentation or tests for some part of your code, this probably means that this code is just not good and needs to be rewritten. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't spare time here either. And now that we have uh, the model, we can evaluate it. And uh, the, same, the same rules apply for evaluation. You also create the, the pipeline for evaluation that is reusable. And those two elements allow you to perform um, already solid experiments that can be repeated uh, in a systematic manner. And once you have your model, uh, we can move on to the next part, that is deployment. And uh, this is the pipeline in which our um, new classifier had to be integrated. Uh, so you can see it here. And um, it's, a, it's a third party pipeline, pretty complex. And um, uh, of course, here we needed to cooperate with quite a few teams to make it happen. Uh, there were some backend people and engineers involved and um, the data science part, of course, wasn't uh, very big here, but it was still important that we uh, build a simple Flask API that could serve um, the, the purpose of a classifier. And uh, we, we still had to communicate with all those teams um, to, to make it happen. Um, and uh, finally, we have the monitoring. Um, so uh, here you want to make sure that your model is um, not spitting out some unreasonable uh, information or prediction. And uh, we actually were a bit concerned about the, the quality of our model because uh, the training data we got was from 2016. And uh, for news articles, uh, it, it seems very old because um, a lot has changed since then. There were new presidents, uh, new, um, new celebrities, and this all wasn't really included in the training corpus. So uh, what we decided to do was um, to create a system in which we can pull the uh, data from this live stream from 2020 and present it to the content team 
uh, in the form of a relabeling uh, app that um, my colleague Elena mostly built. <laughs> uh, I think she's here with us today uh, with StreamEat. Um, and yeah, the, the content team just assessed whether the article had the correct prediction or not. And with this data that we got back uh, from them, we were able to uh, see the, the true quality of our model on the 2020 data. And we created um, an, a dashboard in which you can uh, see which uh, categories performed better, which, which performed worse, uh, what categories were confused with which and, and see what articles were misclassified. So you can investigate a little more um, why something happened or didn't happen. And of course, with this information and insight, you can make a more educated decision on uh, what data needs to be added to the training corpus in order to retrain the model. Uh, so the next step for our project will be to retrain the model with more data and more up-to-date data. Um, so right now we're kind of done with the whole cycle. Um, of course, this process goes on because every now and then you need to check the, um, the quality of the model and perhaps retrain the model. Uh, but still, uh, I would like to answer two questions. The first one is how do you progress and not get stuck uh, with your project? Uh, so uh, the obvious uh, answer, but very important, is to stay in touch with your stakeholders. Uh, we had uh, weekly meetings on which every, uh, every team or every member can uh, tell about their progress, about some problems they have, uh, there were many situations in which we couldn't pro proceed with certain steps of the project because something was blocking us and we got the help from other teams uh, that perhaps had um, more power in those areas. Um, and of course, during those meetings, we also reviewed the tickets. Some turned out to be unnecessary. We updated the roadmap and uh, we kept our uh, documentation uh, clear. And uh, one less obvious thing that you can do is to give a talk or write a blog post. And so we did. Um, and uh, you can find it on Medium. I think it's a, it's a pretty nice way of documenting, documenting your, your work and your efforts and also taking a step back and looking at what you've done and where you're really going with the project. Um, I'm not a big fan of writing blog posts, but I appreciate it's... Uh, uh, how useful it can be sometimes. Um, and the last project, the last uh, question for today is how to tell your project is actually finished. Um, so again, a very simple answer is to just check what was your MVP definition from the scoping session. And if your product meet, meets all the requirements, uh, then you're kind of done. But of course you still should talk with your uh, stakeholders, so with, with the final users of the, um, of the product and check with them whether uh, there is anything else that needs to be done. And one other thing you can do is to organize a retrospective session, uh, which again is a meeting where you bring people together and you talk about the project, how it went, whether uh, some things went well, some things were, went wrong, what could be improved for the future uh, work, uh, even if you don't um, continue on working on this project, you can get some learnings for your future projects and your future work. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mogorata. This was an amazing talk, and uh, we will go straight to the questions. Um, so we don't lose any time as we start a bit later. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lisa asked, uh, do you have a coding scheme in your team to ensure people uh, name files or elements of code in the same manner? And how do you communicate it to, so outside people from other departments, uh, to outside people from other departments, for example, camel case slash uh, lower uh, minus, <laughs> I forgot how to say it, or dot? Uh, we, we don't have... Um we don't have any system because um, it's also, um, I, don't, I don't know if it came out clear, but 
uh, we always cooperate with different companies as Axel, Axel Springer AI. So um, I think, of course, if you work within one company, you can have this one, uh, one way of doing uh, every element of the project. But here we always just uh, talk with uh, our team members um, and decide on all those things. So for example, yeah, the naming of the objects in the code or how do we write a message when we commit things to GitHub. So all those things are just uh, bespoken in the beginning of the project um, to align on one style. Okay, uh, there was another question by Melanie. So which software was involved in each of the steps? Um, all right, so all the steps. Or do we have any clearance on the question? Because, uh, well, here, uh, like I said, in the business um, scoping, we, we basically sat down and talked according to the, the agenda we had prepared. And uh, in data preparation, uh, we used Jupyter notebooks and, of course, uh, Python libraries because we, we coded in Python. Um, we um, mostly used scikit-learn and NumPy libraries. Uh, we ended up uh, using logistic regression for the classifier, um, but we also tried many, many other ones from scikit-learn. Uh, we also had uh, experiments with BERT, but um, the results there weren't really uh, satisfying enough to continue with it because the model itself was much heavier and for us it was important that the the models um, are lightweight can provide the predictions quickly and don't are not too costly to host um, host them for all the languages so actually logistic regression performed really well um, above the expectations and um, we we went for it uh, perhaps it's going to change in the in the future, but for now, this this is the winning model. And then for the deployment, uh, like I said, we use the Flask API to wrap the model, and then it's hosted on Kubernetes, and um, we monitor the the performance of the API itself with Datadog, and uh, we have this additional monitoring that we created with Streamlit. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned everything. Uh, the, the models and the, the, the hosting and then the storing the data happens with AWS. Okay. Uh, and like, uh, I didn't get the, um, the part where you said about the classifier. Was it like uh, supervised learning or unsupervised? So did you have the... It was supervised learning. So uh, yeah. like I also showed in the example of this uh, inconsistent labeling, uh, yeah. the data we got, uh, were labeled by a content uh, team um, person. Uh, so this was supervised learning. We had the, the labels together with the data. And oh. we, were, we were checking, uh, well, different kinds of models. So logistic regression, um, Bayesian models. Um, oh, I don't remember right now. Uh, passive aggressive classifier, SGD. So, um, a pretty broad spectrum of, um, of and how, how large was your uh, training set uh, it depends on the language uh, but I think they were like uh, 1.5 uh, no wait uh, I think 12 12,000 data points more or less for for those two first languages and then um, it's very different uh, depending on the language because right now we're in the process of adding more languages and there are, um, I don't know, there's Greek, there is um, Croatian and of course for, for them there are less common languages. Uh, it's not so easy to label the data so then the data, data sets gets a bit smaller. Uh, the English language, um, you don't need to be a native speaker to, to label it so the data set is also big. Okay, that's super interesting. Uh, there are quite many questions now. So um, there is one by Go. Uh, I just see Go. So um, sh thank you for the great presentation first. <laughs> that's also very good feedback. Uh, how long did the pro uh, project take and how many people were working on it? Um, so um, this was kind of a side project for update. And we decided that we're going to have um, 
two people uh, working two days a week on average on it. And it started in December and it's, um, it's still happening, but the first iteration, so when the first model uh, went into production, this happened, I think, around May or June. So uh, we, cal we calculated it once that I think it altogether took us, um, I think, 30 uh, days, uh, if you combine all those two, two days per week, to, to make uh, the, like a fully functioning product uh, in production. Um, and yeah, altogether on the update side, there were two data scientists, but they were switching between each other. So we always had two people at a time working on the project. Okay, uh, there's another question by Wiebke. Um, she asks, which model performed best? Uh, yes, yeah, so this, this was logistic regression for us, uh, for this data. Um, I wish I had uh, more slides here. Maybe I can, we, we actually have a table, but uh, maybe I can just refer you to the talk that you can find on YouTube. It was uh, presented at Pi Data Berlin meetup uh, or in our blog post. I think we also uh, describe the performance of different models. So you'll find a table with, um, um, with each model and our comments about how it works for our data set. Um, for, for the evaluation of those models, we use the weighted F1 score uh, because uh, the existing classifier system uses this metric and to compare ourselves with us, to, with them, to, to check if we're matching their performance, we had to stick to the same metric. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much, Mogojata. We're running uh, out of time. We have to come to the next yep. step. There's other people uh, thanking you for this insightful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I can just um, say the same. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, you, um, can, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or exactly. GitHub and I can answer the remaining okay. questions. Exactly. So that's what I wanted to say as well. So just connect with Mogojata on uh, LinkedIn. And um, if you have any other questions, that we can uh, talk about now. Thank you very much. <laughs>